The John Campia Show, in association with Designing Hollywood, presents... Welcome to the Designing Hollywood Podcast. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. The Designing Hollywood Podcast is dedicated to all things movies, the movie industry, and its talented professionals. Today's episode is sponsored by Paris Costumes. Our guest today is a Toronto-based award-winning costume designer who has collaborated on plays, feature films, short films, television movies of the week, and series projects, embracing contemporary, period, and fantastical scripts. From 1975 to 1991, she's designed costumes and sets for the theater. She received the Dora Mayer Awards for Outstanding Costume Design for Daniel McIver's Jump and John Krasank's innovative first production of Tamara. She transitioned to film and television, where she has successfully utilized her skill with fabric, color, and texture, an eye for detail, and a real talent for capturing character in clothing, including Robert Eggers' The Witch and Kafkad 2020, Best Costume Design in Period Film, winner for The Lighthouse, Adam McGuire's Exotica, Patricia Rosma's When Night is Falling, Lilies by John Grayson, and a film I dearly love, 32 short films about Glenn Gould by Francois Girard. Without further ado, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome award-winning costume designer Linda Muir to the Designing Hollywood show. Linda, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank um, you, you for being so enthusiastic. Well, I have to ask you, I mean, you have a really long, distinguished career, obviously first in theater, and then you transitioned over to televisions and mo- television and movies. Was this something that you've always wanted to do uh, your whole life? And did you grow up as a, a film and theater fan? I think that it started from playing, actually. I think it started from, you know, literally as a child, playing with my mother's clothes. We, my father built us a playhouse. We uh, dressed up in, in their old clothes. There was a, a trunk that had, you know, sounds corny, but there was a trunk that had dresses from the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. Beautiful styles. Um, I think that had someone asked me what I wanted to be when I was, you know, in primary school, I think I would have said without hesitation, an English, English school teacher, you know, I, I think that... Um, um, for whatever reason, that was, you know, kind of what I had uh, imagined for myself. Mm. I think that um, I was probably about 12 or 13 when I was um, initially in high school. Um, I took a theater course and the theater teacher was magnificent. She was um, absolutely um committed to um, bringing excitement, you know, for two students in, in terms of um, not only reading plays, but also putting them on, mm. uh, mounting them. Um, and I think that, I think that was when I realized that, you know, novels were one thing, um, but in the world of theater, there were, uh, you know, the, the sort of psychological and uh, emotional the sort of um, landscape for characters just completely came alive. And, um, you know, so I would say that it wasn't, uh, it was an early passion, but it wasn't necessarily something that I was, you know, determined to do. I I think that um, when I was uh, in my, throughout my teens and in my early twenties, Um, It was the 70s and there were unbelievable opportunities. Um, My sister is three years older than I am and she was in university when I was still in high school. And so she was giving me all of her material that she was studying and um, all of the books that she was studying and novels. And I think that, um, you know, I think that I found high school uh, sort of boring and it was the guidance counselor that actually recommended um, what was called at that time a free school and I thought well what's that and I went and investigated it and it was actually absolutely perfect for me because I could audit courses um, university courses while I was still in high school and so it was just you know the world's your oyster Um, 
And then people started to ask me to do things. You know, they would say, would you like to act in this? Would you like to direct that? Would you like to, you know, and, and always um, it was a case of doing the costumes, you know, sometimes the sets, but also doing the costumes because there really wasn't anyone else that could do the costume. Mm. And, uh, or was available to do the costumes and I sewed anyway. So it was kind of, you know, seemed natural. Um, and then I was invited when I was probably about 18 to a uh, sort of brainstorming session with the Ontario government and um, a, a, a actor director who I had worked with in community theater actually. And he had suggested me uh, to come and represent students. And so I did. And there, at that collection of people, um, I met a, a producer for a small, very small alternative theater. And I went, I was very shy. Um, and there I met a man called Paul Bettis who, who really became my mentor. He became you know, one of my dearest friends. He became the godfather of my son and he you know, just taught me so much. Um, I stayed at that theater for about five years. And then I think it was a, a decision that was taken by the four of us that ran the theater that, you know, either the next play, either we really you know, blow it out of the water or, you know, we need to, to try something else. And so um, along, I guess at this, that same period, um, I was, working at the theater. And I was also working in the media department at a very large um, institutional, uh, it's called OASI, it's an educational facility. And, um, and I was also in the um, sort of spring through um, September working at the Festival of Festivals, which was the precursor for TIFF. So, mm. Um, at that time, um, there were not just the parties that were designed, but all of the offices had designs. Um, the trade forum, the um, business portion of the festival also had um, uh, environments created. And so I worked on that. And then once the festival opened, I had my staff pass and I would just go and see film day after day after day for the entire duration of the festival. And that, that was... I guess between 1979 and 1984, I did that. So, you know, that was, again, um, one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. So that's my rather odd, um, you know, background. Now, you know, a lot of the people that I've spoken to, a lot of the designers talk about getting a, a pretty rigorous academic background like they did study arts or they studied design fashion and they learned to do things like so and you 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 mentioned that you had already you'd already done that you were doing that growing up how how rigorous of a background would you recommend for people looking to get into the profession now um what are I some think, of the i i think that that would totally depend on the person you know i think some people um, need that discipline. They need, maybe they know vaguely what they want to do, but they, but they use university to cement those um, ideas, those passions, those, those venues, those possibilities. Um, for me, I, you know, I, I have always approached it more from curiosity. I'm curious mm. about something and then I go out and find, you know, find out about it. I find people who can teach me about it. Uh, I became a parent quite quickly when I was making costumes um, initially in theater that I really should learn how to do this properly. You know, that there's <laughs> probably a much easier way of doing this than the way that I'm, you know, um, doing it, you know, just um, with my own ideas. And so I did take um, a costume. It wasn't actually costume, it was fashion cutting. Um, and I learned tons doing that. And that was very helpful. It's not something that I would say that I can do. I wouldn't hire myself out as a cutter, but I can certainly speak with cutters and I can certainly um, you know, draw what I need. In terms of sketching, I would have said in a perfect world, um, I would be able to do that much faster. What I have learned is that when I'm sketching, 
Um, it takes me quite a long time to do sketches, but then what I find cutters say is that they know exactly what I want. They can tell from the sketch, um, they're not exaggerated, they're not flamboyant, they are very workmanlike. Um, and it's interesting on, on the Northman because of the sheer volume of sketching that I had to do. It's the first time that I worked with um, a, a concept artist and I actually um, worked with one of my assistants who has a huge art background and he did everything on his laptop. Um, and so what I would do is I would do roughs um, and then he would, you know, either with an image of Nicole or an image of Anya or um, Alexander, he would do a very rough outline for me. And then I would do move it from rough sketch into uh, the world of, um, you know, more developed sketch. And then he would take that and work it up and then I would consult with him. And so he was, he was with us in the workroom. So, you know, it was an ongoing process. And the reason that we did that on the Northman and not for instance, on the witch um, is because uh, Nicole was coming quite late. She was um, committed for quite a long period of time for her, uh, her previous project. And so um, I needed to have the capability if there were to be any changes to, to make those changes very quickly and to show people you know, what they needed. So that all needed to be preloaded into his laptop. Um, and also with the studio picture of this size, it was interesting to, um, to realize that perhaps people were more comfortable with sketches that were more worked up, you know, with, you could actually tell it was Nicole, you could tell sure. it was Alexander. Um, you know, so for someone who is starting out, I mean, I, I don't know that I can advise anybody what their, you know, path needs to be, but for me, um, it really was about it really was about working with people who excited me, you know, um, writers, uh, directors, uh, first in theater and, and then in, in film and television. Um, so much of what we do is luck, you know, so much of what we do is it, who do you meet when and, and do you hit it off, you know? Um, so like that. Now, when you were growing up, were you a, a film fan? Did you watch a lot of movies oh, and television? You know, back in the day, you had we had access to so much. You know, I, I find I find it a little frustrating because you know the notion is that we have um, through the internet, through streaming, through all of these these various um, services that we have access to so much more, but I'm not so sure that that's actually true. I still rent DVDs. I still go and, you know, actually search out hard copies of things. Mm -hmm. um, not to say that I don't stream things, but I, I, I find that there isn't necessarily, you know, the, a lot of the very obscure films that we watch in researching, um, you know, Robert's scripts are not available unless you, you can find them to rent. Um, or buy, and you know, uh, it, uh, we have an incredible um, rental DVD rental place here in Toronto, thank God. Um, but when I was growing up, you know, Elwi Yost had Saturday Night at the Movies, and they, it was, uh, you know, every week another classic, fabulous film. I mentioned the um, uh, Toronto Film Festival, Festival of Festivals at that time. I mean, any filmmaker that had not just new work, but there were also retrospectives and, you know, you saw something new and that just piqued one's imagination, you know, curiosity, what else have they made? You know, so I would go and, and search that out. So I wouldn't say that I have always been um, a cinephile. I would say that I've always read more than anything. Mm. Um, read, 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 read. Um, and I read many, many different things, many different um, genres. And I go through periods, I think now, particularly when what we do is, um, you know, as much as, as I love what I do, it does occupy a huge amount of time. And so when my time is my own again, then I'm very careful about what I watch. I'm very careful about, and, and during the pandemic, interestingly enough, 
because we were so isolated and and so everyone was watching right. Netflix. Uh, I actually started to listen to audiobooks, which I had never done before because I could paint while I was listening to them or I could sure. while I was listening to them or, you know, my husband and I could lie together on the couch and listen to them and we weren't focused on a television screen, you know, alone in our home. Um, so that's been, that's been kind of interesting too. Mm. Um, you know, no, no images at all in that. Well, I found like, you know, I look at your, your specifically when you got into film, you worked on a lot of, a lot of movies like uh, Satie and Suzanne yes. uh, is a film that I have not seen, but when I was researching you, um, it's, I, I mean, a movie about a composer, about Eric Satie, who I quite enjoy uh, having memories of, of his lover, you know, at this flooded cafe in Paris, I'm like, I, I love this idea that you worked on a film about a, a composer thinking about why he composed and going back over his life. I mean, a, a, a movie about actually the creation of art and memory and all of that. And um, I love that you've worked on films like that. And Adam McGowan's Exotica, which is the first Adam McGowan movie I saw, you know, you designed that as well. Are, are you attracted to films with characters that have sort of an inner monologue that that you see come out in the they're expressing something that they have inside them that they they have to get out in some way shape or form i think so i mean the story is always always important um i think that i think one of the things that people found um directors producers writers perhaps found in me early on um, is an ability to um, pull together a concept, you know? So with really difficult material, how are we gonna visualize this? How are we gonna fabricate it? You know, um, you know how are we gonna think about this? <coughs> um, so I think that when I read scripts that have very difficult um, imagery that I find fascinating, you know, um, interesting, makes me want to, you know, consider how, how could that be done? You know, what should that look like? What could that look like? Um, and, you know, I mean, with Robert's films, there is a lot of, um, a lot of reading, a lot of research about the material world in reality, but you know, there are also lots of films that I've done where there wasn't that, um, I wasn't given that backstory. I wasn't, you know, the, mm. the director or the writer wasn't necessarily interested uh, so completely in, um, you know, such a high level of, of rigor and such a high level of realism. And so, you know, it, it, it totally depends on the project. It depends on um, and really, you know, it, it comes from those decisions that um, the way something is going to be shot or, or realized comes from from the director. You know. Well, it's funny because uh, that film, uh, your Sati film, was actually nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Long well, Form yeah, Video. We have in in Toronto, in Canada. Throughout the 90s, um, the uh, Rhombus Media produced some of the most stunning and interesting performing arts um, films. You know, the uh, other project that I did with Atom was one of um, uh, one part of a multi part film that was um, the Goldberg Variations. And so the one that I did with Autumn was called Saraband and it was with Yo-Yo Ma and uh, Laurie Singer and Autumn wrote, um, you know, a, a fictional narrative. And, um, you know, the, the, there were other parts um, to the film as well. The Stratford Festival here in Ontario is world renowned, you know, amazing um, Shakespearean festival. And they had done a production of Long Day's Journey and Tonight with Martha Henry and William Hutt. 
And um, I think it had run uh, two consecutive seasons at Stratford and then there was the desire to film it. And uh, a really terrific filmmaker, David Wellington, um, did the film version and all of the sets were different, all the costumes were different, but because the um, company, the theatrical company had done it every night or however many times a week for two years, it was vitally important, particularly with the costumes that everything feel the same, you know, so everything looked different, but it had to feel the same. So that was, you know, um, an interesting um, addition to the job. Um, I think that, you know, where does one find these amazing projects now to watch them, you know, all these years later? Um, I think some of them, because music was always a huge part of many of the rhombus um, projects. Barry Weinstein, one of the, um, one of the um, um, founders of, of rhombus, director, writer, did an incredible rendition that I worked on of uh, called September Songs, mm. music of Kurt Vile, you know, and it's mm -hmm. Tracy Stratus and Elvis Costello and Lou Reed and, you know, you name it, you name it, and they're in it singing. I'm a big Three Penny Opera fan, so. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so, you know, I, I mean, I, I it would be fantastic if these various, um, you know, truly fabulous films, uh, uh, if people had access to them. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I. Well, things are getting harder and harder to find, too, especially like a lot of these Canadian productions as well. Some of them have kind of fallen through the cracks or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think about Exotica. To me, it's 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 almost because it's cast with Canadian royalty, you know, Ilias Kateas and Don yeah. McKellar and Bruce Greenwood and Mia Kirshner and all that. I mean, it's just and I, that was the first time. You know, I was really knocked out by that movie, but it it's and in terms of the co the costume designs very memorable in Exotica, not just you know what Mia Kirshner is or isn't wearing, but I, I really I love Bruce Greenwood. That was the first time I ever saw Bruce Green Greenwood. I fell in love with Bruce Greenwood as an actor, but you know you really capture this really slick sort of modern uh, sensibility in that film. You know, and I was wondering, like, when you're designing a film like Exotica, it, do you begin with the script or a feeling, the director? How how would you start off when you're when when you get assigned or you you take the job to do a film like Exotica? What is your process? Well, with with, with Exotica, it was uh, meeting with Atom. It was reading the script. It was breaking the script down. It was trying to figure out, you know, what are the key moments that where either great change happens or uh, there's an insight that, you know, can be offered through the clothing. Um, I mean, one of the more um, uncomfortable parts of that research was actually going to strip clubs. And that was, you know, a wide range of, um, you know, um, clubs. And, um, but, the, but the club that Atom had imagined in Exotica because it was Zoe's mother's club, mm. it was a much, much odder, unique, um, um, elevated notion. Yes. Uh, I mean, I, for some reason, I, I don't know why, but in projects that I've designed, Things sometimes come in in groups, you know, um, I'll do uh, the witch and then, you know, the good witch and then and something else bitten that has witches in it. And they'll come, you know, kind of in these little groups. I, I also had with um, Exotica, um, I did another film called All Hat and um, there, were, there was a, a sort of um, stripper character in, in All Hat. And so rather than doing, you know, the Lycra and, um, you know, short shorts, you know, I tried to do a bit more theme oriented um, strippers and people loved it. They, they you know, uh, why are strip clubs actually like this? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so definitely working with the director, definitely working with the actors if possible. And, you know, it's odd when I was designing in theater, uh, the rehearsal process was just so important to me, you know, being with the actors, listening on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, the growth, the change, the realizations, trying it this way, trying it that way. My, I, I love actors. I 
could never do that. I could never do what they do. Not, neither could I. <laughs> it's extraordinary. The, the, where it comes from and how they do it is, is so incredible to watch. Um, but in, in the theater, when people would say, well, why don't you, you know, why don't you design in larger venues? And I sort of said, well, you know, it, that's, you're, you're designing it and they, they're not even sure who's cast yet in many of these cases. You know, what I really love is I love working with individual people and giving them what they need for the, the version of that character that they're going to do. And then I find now years and years and years later, I, the actors arrive and they, you can tell that there's a certain amount of nervousness, you know, with Willem, you know, initially he's, he's from the theater. He was, you know, he was working with the Wooster group until very recently. Yeah. And, you know, so for him, it's like, you can tell he's wondering, is this going to be good? And, you know, is this not going to be good? You know? Um, and so I find now that it's interesting to have actors say to me, thank you. You have given me you have given me such a great start. You know, I'm coming in so late, you're already filming. Um, everyone that I'm coming into the scenes with, perhaps they've been filming for a lot longer. You know, this I can really work with, you know, and that that is just amazing to hear that. Well, you know, I, I really want to get into to talking about, you, you now have a longstanding relationship with Robert Eggers. You, you've done three films for him, including, I mean, he, he's gone from, you know, The Witch and The Lighthouse were not big budget movies. Now The Northman is a very expensive, sprawling, filmed in a bitter cold, on location, a historical epic. Uh, you know, I'm curious, tell us the story of how did you come across him? How did you, you, you meet him? And I'd love to hear how you both started working together on The Witch because when I saw The Witch, I was truly, I was knocked out by it because I'm always banging on on my own YouTube shows about verisimilitude, the quality of things being real. Mm -hmm. And from the, the first shots of that film, you could, you could feel the environment. You know, you, it was cold and it was, it really, the, the evocation of the period was so well done. And the clothes, especially, it seemed so authentic. I mean, I, I was just knocked out by all of it and the, the tone and the mood that he created all the way through. And then, you know, to me, you know, people talk about Freddy Krueger or Leatherface or Jason Voorhees or uh, I'm like Black Phillip, man, come on. You have a fantasy character in this demon goat from hell who speaks and, and, and you buy it. What was it like to 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 meet him and and how did he talk about the witch and and how did you two begin working together? Well, um, due to budget, the the, um, uh, the fact that it was a lower budget, um, the decision was taken to um, make the film in Canada. Uh, I didn't know Robert until he came to Toronto to interview costume designers. Uh, I think I interviewed with him twice. I think it was three times. I think it was twice. And um, I, I think, I mean, we hit it off, obviously, but I think that it was perhaps that he and I had similar backgrounds in terms of theater, in terms of um, the amount of research that we both declared that we like to do. Um, I went to Plymouth Plantation with, um, which is just, I think, south of Plymouth Rock, incredible um, reconstruction of many buildings of the, of the, the um, um, Pilgrim period, and uh, with Robert and with uh, Craig Lathrop, the production designer, and um, you know, everything that we did together for The Witch in, in um, pre-prep was so fascinating because it was, you know, okay, this is, you know, this is how it looked. This is how it felt. This is, um, you know, and, and how would we then um, work that into, you know, some of the designs for The Witch? So 
Robert had been working on The Witch for, I think, uh, four or five years prior to actually raising the money to, to film it. And um, so he had really clear ideas about what he wanted. He, he was incredibly articulate about not just the characters' backstories, but the whole um, you know, history involved. And um, you know, I could listen to him for days. <laughs> <laughs> now, does that for you, when you, know, you have a director with that clear of a vision, is that something that you appreciate and like, or do you prefer to be sort of more able to explore and maybe come up and bring your own ideas? I'm still, I'm, I'm still totally able to explore. And, you know, this is a starting point with Robert. He is all, um, he's all for uh, each of us bringing our own research to further, you know, to add more layers to what he's um, thinking of. About. So I would say that um, I totally prefer to work with a writer director who has very clear ideas about what they want. When you talk about the degree of um, authenticity, I do believe that an audience, you know, even if they're not um, aware of what the difference is, you know, they're not necessarily aware of hand stitched clothing or. Mm the proper proper tool having been used to create the you know the wall behind the actor or whatever uh the proper lantern or you know i do believe that an audience absorbs that it's not things they're familiar with and therefore oh that's interesting i totally uh, agree with you I, I mean i i think an audience can feel that kind of authenticity and 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 not only that, the actors can, and everybody, the, the director of photography can, will like to make sure that all of that detail comes out and you feel it. And all of that, I think, comes into play. And The Witch, to me, is a master class of how to create, there's not one detail in any frame of that movie that is left to chance. It is so beautifully conceived from the ground up from every every bit of that film is dripping with authenticity and i think that's what makes it so effective i mean when you watch it from the beginning it's seeping into your being mm -hmm. i i was just knocked out by it and part of it was because man those costumes that you came up with i'm like they didn't where'd you get them <laughs> like, like how'd you make what'd you make them like where do you go to, to make a costume to come up with that? What do you do? How do you, how do you, do you have, how do you source fabric? Hey, that's very difficult. And it's becoming more and more difficult. It was difficult for the witch um, because I was looking for very plain woven wools um, in very muted colors that we could either dye or, um, or just distress. Um, it was very difficult on the Northmen as well because they are very particular fabrics, um, very particular wools, uh, woven in very particular ways. So I, I started um, very early on in the process with the Northmen, reaching out um, to weavers uh, throughout Europe um, and people who, who created jewelry, people who created tablet weaving. Uh, more and more and more, the more that I learned and the more that I designed. So with The Witch, um, I mean, it, it always starts with sketches. And, um, and then with The Witch, I worked with an incredible uh, cutter, Brenda Clark, here in Toronto. I love her. I work with her a lot. Um, and so like Robert, working with Louise and Jaron and Craig and myself, um repeatedly you know you you develop a shorthand you develop um a trust you develop uh an honesty that is just very direct and so um with the people that i work with here in toronto there are tailors and there are cutters who i love working with and i will try to, to bring them with me um on the northman uh there's a canadian cutter called francis sweeney who i would not worked with before, but um, the, the two people who I uh, was used to working with were unable to come to Ireland for the amount of time that uh, was involved. And that only became longer with COVID. Um, and Frances was amazing. You know, she, she was uh, 
um, uh, you know, really lovely to work with. So, you know, I, I think that it helps tremendously to understand how to cut things. I have, you know, books on books and books and books and, and, you know, so it is true that not one book will give you everything. So, you <laughs> know, a sleeve is from here, uh, you know, a collar is from that book. Uh, this is the idea. And then, you know, how far can you push it to, to keep it within period, but um, not have it be the same garment over and over and over again, you know, mm -hmm. It was interesting to me on the Northman, how many different things could I design, you know, to be perfect for the character, hopefully, but also different from every other piece and still create, um, you know, a, a whole um, that makes sense and, and seems like it's a world, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, again, you did such a wonderful job on on the witch and also the lighthouse obviously it's two guys <laughs> you know two guys going relatively insane in their own ways <laughs> and, and, and and yet again the the choice of aspect ratio and black and white and the the the, the fabrics that you use in that you did a, a phenomenal job well, with, 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 well, thank you with, with the lighthouse um what was I'd, I had done one black and white short before actually um and Don McKellar actually was a it was in that that was a French Canadian uh writer director and um other than that I was sort of okay black and white this is interesting um so Jared and Robert and I had many discussions uh, uh, with Craig as well um and also Jared was using uh filter he likes his filters he loves his filters and um so i was trying to understand exactly what would happen you know with certain colors would that would um you know the, the, the traditional and typical navies of the wiki uniforms um you know would that be too dark would would it be better to go with something else um something lighter and in the end, I did um, I did a lot of testing just with my iPhone in black and white, and Jaron helped me also with a few programs that he had on his laptop. And uh, we actually arrived at the decision that uh, to keep it quite naturalistic. And um, what became very important in the lighthouse was texture. You know, the, the weave, um, or the the knitting of the of the sweaters, incredible sweaters, and um, the oil skins were made from scratch. You know, I couldn't find anything that I liked in terms of weight that gave a real period feel, a heftiness. And so we bonded two fabrics together and uh, the tailor, um, Marvin Schlichting in Toronto, um, you know, he, he did an incredible job of cutting um, all of the clothing actually for both uh, Rob Pattinson and Willem. Um, and, you know, the styles are great. They're, they're, they're wonderful. Uh, I'd done that period before, um, so it was familiar to me, but, um, you know, choosing styles that were very particular, um, that would, would separate the two characters, you know, to give a, a kind of past for, um, for Rob's character and, um, you know, kind of old salty dog for, for Wilm. You know, it was, it, and it was incredible to be on set, you know, for The Witch and for The Lighthouse and The Northman. You know, you just wonder, how did anybody survive in history? <laughs> well, it, you know, now let's just, just jump into The Northman because obviously I love the fact that it's your, and now your third period film working with Robert Eggers and you, you keep, you've gone back even further than The Witch and uh, this story has been told variations of the story. Hamlet is sort of a variation on this story. And you're going back to, to a, this sort of famous historical tale. Um, how did Robert Eggers come to you again and say, you know what, it's time. I'm going to do my Viking revenge epic. <laughs> like when he came and asked you this, what was your first reaction? What was the phone call when like? Read it, when I first read it, I thought, well, this is very large, you know, it's it's epic it's huge 
um, and, and incredible characters, you know, in, incredible um, twists and turns. And, you know, I, I'm the same with the sketches. Um, I don't do breakdowns on my computer. I do them all by hand. And for the Northman, I did a chart that was probably about nine feet long and about four feet high with every scene and every character really on this chart and I could look at it at any moment and see okay so we, we've seen this character here 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 and here you know what's their arc you know I mean it was an amazing tool and uh, when I took it to Belfast and I put it up on the wall my assistants were sort of whoa that's such a great idea <laughs> <laughs> because it's all in front of you you know so um that chart did show me that there were that it was huge and also that Amleth is in basically every scene, you know. Right. Um, so Robert has done for each of the projects that I've worked with him um, on the he starts with lookbooks that he initially, I think it's a combination of you know, both for him, he uses it as uh, research to write. You know, he, he needs to know for himself because he is, uh, has a voracious curiosity, uh, which is one of the things I love about him. Um, so to write the, the pieces, he, he wants to know, you know, what are the characters dealing with? You know, what, how are they dressed? What, what are their outbuildings like? You know, what is the lantern like? What is the fork like? You know, whatever. And so he has his own lookbooks. Uh, sometimes he has sketches that he, you know, has done um, for characters. He, he uses it as a part of his process. And so, you know, what a gift to receive that at the beginning of any project, you know, it's like, this is where we're starting. And then it's discussion, it's research. Um, it's becoming familiar with everything and having it all at your fingertips and in your mind so that you can actually start to think, okay, well, what are the choices, you know, for this character? You know, should it be this or should it be that? And, and you know, if you, if, if, when I felt that I had enough information um, that I felt comfortable starting to sketch, then it comes, you know, pretty fluidly after that. Um, and I also, it was, it was really lovely to be able to uh, excite other people about this. You know, I mean, what do we know about the Vikings? I knew basically nothing about the Vikings when I started. That was actual and, and factual, you know, like. <laughs> when you, so you unfurl this giant chart for your team. Yes. And did did you show Robert Eggers this chart as well? Oh yes, of course. So yeah. so when you're I, think I took photographs of it and sent it to him, you know, after I'd made it and said, you know, how crazy am I? <laughs> well, so when when you when you're looking at this, you know, it's one thing. I I I I'm sure you got into like work mode and you're you're making this chart. But when it was done and you looked at it, did you think, oh, we can't do this? Like, was it intimidating? Like looking at the. It actually, it's 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 quite the opposite. I find um, the more the more I break it down, anything, the more I break something down, the more I understand it. What are the parts? Um, how do they fit together? You know, and then you take it apart and you think, okay, so this is this is how it has to work together. But individually, who are they? You know, individually, what would they do? What would they wear? What would they want to show? What would they not want to show? What would they you know, um, you know, what, what's peculiar about them, if anything, mm. maybe nothing is, maybe they don't care about clothing. Maybe they only want, like Filner would be a good example, for instance, when in the Northman, you know, uh, unlike his, his half brother, who is all about showing everything all the time, excess, excess, King Orvindil, the, the character that uh, Ethan Hawke portrays, you know, Filner, played by Clay's Bang, is, yeah. is the, the, the brotherless exactly yeah <laughs> <laughs> names in the sagas are to die for they really oh. are <laughs> yeah i mean I, I you know uh uh it, it is fantastic the these these like uh, you're working with anya taylor joy again obviously she was in the witch as as olga of the birch forest yes <laughs> I, I love that i mean she you know she is the first time i really 
saw her was in uh, The Witch. And her her presence, there is something about her. She's one of the most captivating actresses and seeing her in, in something like Emma and then, of course, um, The Queen's Gambit, where she just, what a, what a, just a knockout performance and somebody who, not of this earth. But, you know, when you, when you come back and you got to work again with Willem Dafoe coming back from, um, coming back from the lighthouse, what's it like for you as a costume designer working with actors again and again and again? What kind of a relationship uh, do you develop now that you have sort of Robert Eggers? It, it makes sense that coming from the theater, he would now create, he's building his company of players, like what Orson Welles did with the Mercury Theater you know, to, to have him do this and, and that you're part of it. You're part of this company of players and being, being so vital as a costume designer, getting to know these actors, what's it like for you to develop relationships with actors, knowing what they like, what they don't like? How is that for you? It's great because with, with Willem, for instance, uh, I think I mentioned that, you know, with the lighthouse, it was the first time that we had met each other and, um, you know, in, in, in the first fitting, he was um, not wary, but, you know, he wanted to see everything. He wanted to understand. And I completely appreciate that, you know, oh, he wanted to understand why, you know, why this, why that, where, what, you know, what's the story? And so we would tell him and it was great. Um, when he came for his fitting on the Northman, it was just, you know, I mean, I knew he was going to be up for anything. He's just extraordinary, you know, and during, during the filming of The Lighthouse, you know, you could watch the filming of a scene and he would do it eight different ways and each one of them would be absolutely uh, plausible, you know, um, amazing. And he would just do it as this font of ongoing creativity. So he, you know, there was a comfort level there that had already been built up um, while we were working on the lighthouse. And so, uh, you know, it was for me, I understood that for Wilm, he wanted to understand how would this work? How would the actual pieces function? You know, he wanted to be able to put them on, do cartwheels in the dressing room, you know. Because um, he was the fool after all. <laughs> you know? uh, and, um, and also uh, there's a, um, there were some characters that um, that he interacted with that were, you know, larger than life. He wanted to know, you know, how his his character in this costuming would interact with them. Um, so it was it was much easier than uh, had I not met him before. Um, sure, is, is divine. You know, I mean, she's she is incredibly. Um, she just absorbs all of the information. You know effortlessly it's not it doesn't even seem like it's happening and it's happening you know um i her emma actually is one of my favorite um versions of emma. i mean and, and, and it, she's got such range i mean uh, again I, I i was knocked out by her in the in the witch and also the queen's gambit i think is some kind of a, a masterpiece yeah. she has this incredible ability to to appear um, very young, very naive, very innocent. And then just with one tiny little adjustment in the eyes, it was an uh, all knowing, um, you know, real weighted, uh, ancient, you know, old soul kind of feel. Also, I want to ask you about Nicole Kidman. I mean, another actress, I, I think I first saw her in Dead Calm back in the late eighties. And of course she then went on and did Days of Thunder with Tom Cruise, but she's also another actress that, like, I don't know if you've seen her film Destroyer that Karen yeah. Kusama, yes. my God. I mean, talk about uh, talk about a fearless. I, 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 I loved her performance in that. I thought that given everything that she, her body of work, I felt that she probably would be incredibly professional and uh, she was. You know, she arrived really, I mean, the COVID situation was incredibly difficult to work within. And, um, you know, to arrive from a country where there were no cases of COVID. I mean, she'd been working in Australia and it was a completely closed border situation. Um, and so that, that must have been very, 
you know, unnerving for her. So she was great. She was, you know, immersing herself in, in Queen Guthrun. Um, and, you know, she, her character has, um, you know, the interesting um, great wealth when we first see her. And then years later, they're working the farm, um, <laughs> but they love each other. And, um, you know, so she had many costumes to, um, to fit very quickly. And so I made a decision that I have actually not had to make before. Um, I decided to finish everything. I mean, with the, with the number we had, for instance, for her Fredeler um, underdress, which is the, the, the underpinnings for all of the outfits, it's a linen full length, long sleeve um, shift that is worn under all the clothing and to bed. So she had 20 identical shifts that were created to accommodate all of the different filming needs. Some were tacked to a slightly different color for night shots. Um, some were for repeated blood, some were for uh, stunt doubles, riding doubles, um, you know, just all of the different needs uh, required. And, and there were very detailed um, hand stitching on prominent spots on these these garments and so there was no way that we would be able to if we left it until after her fitting because she started filming immediately we would not be able to accommodate that amount of work and so we we left hems and um that was about it i think that we had to adjust one sleeve on one dress one sleeve, no. sleeve on one dress and Otherwise, we were working with incredible measurements, very accurate measurements. I cannot tell. I mean, for actors, it's so important to have a full set of accurate measurements out there in the world if you want to look great. And, and she was amazing. You know, she was um, incredible to watch on, on set uh, for that character to, to develop and... Um, um, you know, very, very brutal, brutal weather, you know, yeah. raining all the time, freezing cold. We shot much later than we had initially planned um, due to COVID. I mean, we had to, we went on furlough for a number of months and, and which was a, actually a godsend for me because I could keep sketching the entire time that I was mm. on, on furlough and um, really you know, get ahead of, uh, a lot of the work when we returned um, and you know so very very cold very wet very muddy and for months and months and months how many um of each costume did you have to create how many duplicates so for instance the there's a very large um, set piece with the attack, uh, the Berserker Viking attack on a Slavic village. Um, the, the Berserkers attack the Palisades and then it's all one huge long shot. They come over the Palisades. There are alleys of um, the village that the horses are, I mean, it just goes on. It's an incredible scene. Realistically, when we were talking about the number of resets and therefore the number of multiples needed for um, the various um, Slav villagers and the special uh, guards, um, you know, the, the, the Slav military. Um, and I felt very strongly that given the conditions, given the muddy set, and the amount of time that it would take to take the background, uh, the crowd um, members to a tent and change them, it would just be far too time consuming. And so realistically, I felt that we were shooting that over a number of days. The costumes could be cleaned in between the days, but on each of those days, I wasn't willing to commit the finances and the more than the finances, the amount of time in the workroom 
in the crowd workroom um, because we had so much. I mean, imagine in the entire film, there are a handful of pieces that are rented. Most of what you see in the entire film has been made for the film. The amount of, of work that we actually accomplished in both the crowd workroom and in the principal's workroom is, is, is phenomenal. And so, you know, I think that there was a moment for, um, you know, some of my colleagues who are used to having endless, uh, an endless supply of, of um, you know, multiples, to actually think about this and say, you know, these are, these are, it's not a t-shirt and jeans. These, each of these pieces is being made. So let us think, you know, very clearly and very realistically about what it is that we need to make. Yeah. And so I think again, because of the size of and the amount of action, um, you know, that decision didn't, didn't um, affect negatively affect what we were shooting, what was problematic, which none of us actually uh, could have um, foreseen was the COVID uh, regulation. Right. Yeah. You know, changing costumes. And, and so that was something that we had to get, you know, used to and-, and, and Which is another nightmare in itself. Oh, it's just made uh, everything so expensive. It's just shocking, really, you know, the, the various necessary, of course, but, you know, it, it has made uh, filmmaking very expensive. Very expensive. Now, I, I got to ask you, one of, one, of, one of whether she's making public appearances, whether she has done her, her unbelievable music videos or appearing in Lars von Trier movies, Bjork. Yes. Uh, clothes have been important to Bjork. I mean, uh, I can't imagine as a costume designer designing for her. <laughs> because if you look at, at a lot of, whether it's her swan dress that she wore to what, the Oscars, you know, or, or any of her music videos. I'm a huge fan of Bjork. I mean, all the way back to the sugar cubes. I mean, I'm a huge fan of hers. When you knew she was going to be in the movie, were you scared? <laughs> like, like yeah. were you intimidated? <laughs> Honestly, of all of, of all of the actors involved, Bjork, you know, we, there, there was a moment, a little um, frisson, you know, kind of. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> but, frisson's a great one of my favorite words. Is it? Oh yeah, <laughs> frisson. Like, like uh, it, I, I first heard that word when I was reading about the director Brian De Palma. Oh. It's, great, it's a great word. <laughs> yeah. So um, we had a we had a video call. And Robert was on the call. And the fact that Robert and Bjork are, are know, know each other and they have a, a friendly relationship, um, Robert and his wife, Ali, uh, you know, really fostered a fabulous warmth. And, um, you know, so that conversation, that initial conversation to show her things and, and to, you know, talk about where we were going with the costume, um one thing that i wasn't concerned about was the fact that she you know would be able to wear this enormous headdress because obviously this is something that she is uh used to doing but um because the the um slav witch is filmed in moonlight massive hole in the temple ceiling and the light is the moonlight that is just coming down and lighting her from above and Jaron does beautiful um, moonlight and he creates it with filters and um, then, and also low light levels. And the filters really do change the colors of the costume. So we had a yeah. similar situation I mentioned in the lighthouse. Um, I had designed, you know, in, in, in um, discussions with Robert, the, the, um, all of the Slav villagers have embroidery all over their costumes and they're in very specific places and they are motifs that are um, embroidered to either, uh, it's, it's like a call to the gods for prosperity or health or many children, whatever. And so we, we, the audience, would have already seen these characters in natural colored linen with 
very bright red embroidery, touches of black embroidery um, in very specific places. And so with the Slav witch, she is within the community, like the Uber writer, the Uber embroiderer, all uh, wishes not just for herself, but for her whole community. And so she's covered in embroidery. And so that would be a real problem if that embroidery just went to black because it's red and because it's being seen under filters. And so we, um, I had many discussions with Jaron and I did uh, more tests and he helped me with that. And we arrived at, the, at a, a pink, pinks and grays. Well, I mean, you know, when you do a sketch and it's in pinks and grays, it doesn't have the same punch. It doesn't have the same power as, you know, a deep red or black. Um, so I had a bit of concern about that, but she was great. You know, that wasn't an issue for her. The fit of things was an issue. Um, um, you know, so when she came and, and we had our fittings, uh, thankfully, the types of materials that we were using actually did lend themselves to alteration. So we could, you know, make her really comfortable. And, and she was, you know, in the end, very happy with with the fit of things and her her skirt i'm not sure that you can see it very clearly um but it's made up of numerous belts that are all wool tablet woven slavic belts mm. individually stitched together to form this skirt mm. and she has you know numerous necklaces which in full color you know you've got deep blues you've got coral you've got you know amber chicken feet, all of these different things, what you get in the moonlight is you get this riot of, you know, um, um, I guess, you know, um, pieces that together make it look like she is loaded with um, talismans and, you know, um, very special, powerful symbols. Mm. And she has the... Um, it's just the barley headdress, but then she also has the cowrie shells and bells uh, in front of her eyes, which have been um, taken by the, not the berserkers, but the, um, the Viking militia that come in. Um, so she was, it, it was a very magical, very magical night watching that scene being filmed. She's just incredible. Now, I also have to ask about your version of the Valkyrie. You know, the, the, yes. the, the, the Val Valkyries seem to be there obviously in Thor, one of the characters we've now got in the upcoming Thor Love and Thunder. Valkyrie is now King Valkyrie, but Valkyries have been, whether it's the ride of the Valkyries and the ring of the Nibelung cycle, you know, and, and, uh, and Wagner's uh, great, uh, great opera. Your version of a Valkyrie, what, uh, how did that? Uh, well, my version of the Valkyrie and Robert's version of the Valkyrie, thankfully, it, you know, she is fierce. She is, um, um, what, from after reading the sagas, it was very clear to me that many of the female characters, there you a giantess, or you have, you know, the Norns, which are very scary, very mm -hmm. scary ladies. Mm. And, um, so, you know, it, it, in discussions with Robert, uh, I was always trying to say, you know, with the shield maiden, with, with the Valkyrie, with these female characters that are warrior type characters, you know, let's, let's really go for it. Let's really, you know, uh, make them powerful. Um, and I found while I was, um, we did a, um, a, a sort of, search for fabrics and any potential rentals in uh, London and in uh, Rome and in Madrid. And while we were in Rome, uh, when I was in Rome with my assistant, I, um, I found a, a tiny little piece of metal in a drawer at a jeweler's and it became the inspiration and the, the model for the tiny pieces of metal that are her on her lamellar. Um, and we had an incredible costume armory. It's the first time that I've worked with uh, armor and it was so much fun. Um, and Gian Paolo Grassi headed up our costume armory and he does actually Thor and you know, many of the Marvel, uh, marvelous Marvel. So he created the, um, the Valkyries Lamellar 
She has tiny, delicate nail with gold trim. Um, you know, not, not the heavy, heavy nail that you see on many of the characters. And her helmet has the swan. Um, but what I really, really love about the Valkyrie is her cloak. You know, it, it, it came from, the idea came from the shape-shifting ability of, um, you know, changing from bird to person, person to bird, um, flight, you know, also to spot her in the night sky. Um, so the red cloak, which hers is, her cloak is really the only very um, unnatural red, you know, it's, it's, it's a red that is, couldn't be achieved with matter or sure. maze or, I mean, like it, it but she's, fantastical um, and she, it's lined completely with three different sizes of feathers and so when she the rider double that was riding um, you know when we were doing tests it became apparent that there was this beautiful weight to it that you know pounded along with the horse and then when she took flight you know, what you saw was the white feathers against the night sky and, and the gold of the helmet and her beautiful long platinum hair. Um, and then when you get the shot of her screaming into the camera, many, many people have mistaken the filing for braces, but in fact, um, you know, there, it was while we were actually working on the Northman, there was um, a book written about um, a number of, of um, I think there, I think there are maybe maybe at eighty bodies that were found uh, primarily, um, I think in in Gotland, and they have their teeth filed, and nobody really knows completely what the filing was about. You know, they don't archaeologists don't believe that they were slaves. They're not sure if they were warriors. They're not because it would have been so painful to. And you know, the notion of, of applying dye um, it, to the ridges in the teeth really pop out and show. So when Robert came back with that idea, I was like, oh yes, this is just fantastic. You know, this is a this is a powerful female um, image. So the the. Valkyrie is, is a very special character for me. We got to talk about Alexander Skarsgård in various shows that you've seen him in. He, he's a beautiful man. Let's face it. He is a, he is a fine specimen of human being. But my God, the man is a beast in this movie. He is a beast. Like, I, 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 what a, I can't even imagine the shape he got into. The, the, what was it like, like, knowing that you're going to design costumes for... I don't know, the prototype of the, <laughs> I don't know what you'd call him. I had seen Tarzan, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, you knew, you knew. I knew. Um, he, and he, I think he actually got bigger than he was in, in, in Tarzan. I mean, Alexander came to Belfast very, very early and, and um, you know, he was rehearsing with Robert he was speaking with Robert he was so I had access to him very early on and he was so easy to work with um you know he understood the um how much uh, obviously how much action he was going to be doing there was no vanity there you know the, 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 any requests that he had of costuming really had to do with comfort you know um, because he knew he was going to be in basically every day of shooting and he was going to be in this, this clothing for a long time. Um, and so he was really open to the, the crudeness of cut. He was really open to all of the slave ideas. Mm. Um, I made the decision to keep the same style of boot for him throughout um, so that he wasn't so that we as the audience we i mean we didn't really need to you know um the the trousers that the ameth wore as the berserker adult um ameth the first scene that we see him in in land of the Rus, he's in much more eastern influenced clothing and so that worked well with the when he had to you know change into a slavic disguise to become a, a slave to go to the farm uh with fulner i hope i'm not 
spoiling anything. No, it's okay. <laughs> I think you've probably read it. Um, anyway, um, so he keeps the same style of boot throughout. And we have many, many versions of these boots um, with varying levels of, of distress. Um, so f comfort and ability to do his work was what was really important to him. But he is the most, he is such a sweet, gentle, hilarious, mischievous, rascally. Did, did you have an overriding design philosophy? I mean, this idea of, of revenge and was there, was there something like, I, I guess I want to ask you, I talked to somebody earlier, uh, uh, an earlier podcast, where it was suggested that sometimes being period accurate isn't necessarily the best thing. That sometimes you want to add a little zhuzh and bring in a little of the, the, the fantastical or the larger than lifeness. And, you know, period reality is a great place to start. But sometimes... You know, you're dealing with your hero character. Sure. Well, I mean, we do we do have characters like the Warrior King and uh, the Sorcerer and the Valkyrie, where that kind of leeway is absolutely you know needed. Um, and but the sagas actually also give us really great clues. Yeah. You know, they do. They do. Um, they set up conventions. So for instance, you know, there's a foretelling of something bad's going to happen when your protagonist is wearing a dark cloak, someone's going to get murdered. So, you know, you can take that information and you can make it a beautiful, you know, you can, you can, for, um, for Amleth's character when he is with Olga uh, at the Tarn and then at the, at the seafront um, on horseback, he's wearing a beautiful blue cloak. That is the same textile that his uh, father, King Orvindil, wore in the opening scenes. Orvindil's is the natural color of the wool in, in a two-part, very large um, diamond twill weave. And then what I did for um, Amla's cloak is to use that same fabric, but to dye it the beautiful blue of the boy's hat. So the boy coming back in a man, they're stolen clothes. Olga has stolen those from the longhouse. They're not they're not Amla's clothes. They're a Viking man, uh, free man's clothes, but they are on Amleth, so they play into you know Amleth's story. Sure. Um, so choices like that for sure, but you know there there are um, there are films where you know taking uh, leeway and going for it and exaggerating things or, or fantasizing things or stylizing, you know, for sure. I mean, there are beautiful examples of, of um, you know, costuming where that has, um, that's been the principle, the, um, the concept, but it wasn't the concept for this. And sure. really the, the research, you know, you, I could provide opulence and layer and layer and layer of you know more wool jewelry you know fur not fur that is just a skin thrown over shoulders but a shaped fur mm. you know and it all was to denote and to and to illustrate the incredible abilities that um that viking uh, artisans had you know like they 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 made they wove women wove wool into these massive sails that allowed viking men to travel such great distances and yeah do such incredible things you know so it kind of all we tried to we tried to imply that um you know it all came back to these abilities you know craftspeople abilities well, listen, I mean, I've, I've, this has been a fascinating conversation and it's been so great to talk with you. And um, I know we've gone a little over our time, but um, I want to thank you for this. But I got to ask, you know, as we wrap this up, first of all, I can't wait to see this movie. I think in my mind, and, and we've been talking about it on the show that I do, on the John Campia show, which, which is a morning entertainment show five days a week. By the way, good Canadian kid. Uh, he, uh, he always, he always likes to say that. He's from he, Hamilton. You know, he's got a, he's from he's from Hamilton. It's, this this will air on his channel. Um, but so he's always he loves it when I interview Canadians or talk to Canadians in any way, shape or form. But I, I have to ask, like, what 
you know, there's a lot of people that watch these and want to know if they want to get into this kind of design work. Obviously, we now live in a social media world where everybody, whether it's Instagram or whatever, people are designing, they're learning about clothes. Where would you suggest the next generation of designers? What advice could you give to them? Expose yourself to as much as you can in terms of um, if it's film that you like, then, you know, find out what you like, find out who's making what you like. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's the same probably as publishing, you know, <laughs> sending, you know, sending a manuscript in, you know, it's probably not going to get you published. So sending a resume, it's difficult, but stay at it. Um, I think that if it's film that one wants to do, then, you know, non-union, start with non-union, work, work, work. Um, you know, there are law, it, it, and I can't speak to um, the States so much that uh, I, I suppose IATSE would be, um, you know, the union that people would want to join, you know, in terms of film work. Um, it's, uh, you know, apprentice yourself and, you know, try to learn as much about filmmaking as you can too because it's not just about designing clothing you know it, it you have to be able to design clothing that is costuming that can be made and that has to um actually do the job you know so it has to be on budget it has to be able to um you know sort of fit within all of the restrictions and there are many um you know uh that our budgets require of us. Do you have anything else coming up that you could talk about? I can't really talk about it, but uh, hopefully soon I will know exactly what it is that I'm doing. <laughs> okay, okay, that's good. Now, do you have a social media presence? Can people follow you on Instagram or? Yes, uh, I have a website, lindamuircostumedesign.com and my Instagram is lindamuircostumedesign. And currently, I mean, pandemic is the only reason that I actually started posting and the Northman. Um, so I've been posting what I am able to post in terms of, um, you know, until the uh, film opens and not giving too much away. Hopefully I'll post more that is very costume specific um, after the film opens. And, um, you know, so those would be the two spots that people can become familiar with my work well linda muir this has been a fascinating conversation and i very much appreciate you sharing your insights and and secrets of working on the northman because my god we've been talking about this movie for months and uh i think the level of, of excitement at least for the viewers on this channel uh, is through the roof and uh people are it's been a long time since we've had a movie like this and i i for one Oh, I can't I wait. Hope, I hope there are many more like this. And thank uh, you. I really enjoyed myself. Oh, this is fantastic. But thank you, Linda Muir, for being on the Designing Hollywood show. Thank you. And a very special thanks to our sponsor, Paris Costumes. Paris Costumes has been a part of the history of the European theater, film, and television industry since 1856 and became 21st century tailors. They are known for being experts in hiring and producing costumes of all periods. Paris Costumes' aim is to become a 21st century costume house through innovation while maintaining the standards of tradition and quality gained over years since 1856. They offer a variety of services, fabrics, accessory samples, leather work, hats, shoes, uniforms, period pieces. Paris Costumes. A costume rental house for film and television. A special thanks to our producer and founder, Martika Ibarra, and of course, our co-founder, legendary costume designer, Marilyn Vance, and our new partner, John Campia, of the John Campia YouTube channel. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in, and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification button, and you can find the Designing Hollywood podcast wherever you get your podcasts. 
also on iTunes. Follow me, Robert Meyer Burnett, on Instagram, on Twitter at BurnettRM, or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. Thanks for watching. We very much appreciate it.